Hi, Guy. Hello, Gary. I say it seems weird uh, having not seen you for over a week. I miss you. I know you do. Uh, I don't miss you at all. Uh, I know. I know. <laughs> you know what? It's so nice to be back with my family, I have to say. And it's nice to be back to the real world and London and all the things that I like to do. And my kids, of course. What I miss is the bus. I, I miss the, getting on that bus and my life is on hold. And it's, your life is so few things it and is. they're all there. It is. There's no chaos on the bus. There's people to protect you, uh, but also miss your sense of humour. I miss having the laugh that we had over the last couple of I, I miss the laugh because I'm not having much of a I've, I've moved into a new house, which is fantastic, and I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for it. But, you know, little things like a kitchen would be nice. So in the old days, you would have said a studio would have come before a kitchen. You would have just got takeaways and be done with no, it. Do you know what the irony is? I've got a studio. I'm sitting in my studio. That went up. It's like, never mind the kitchen as long as I've got my studio. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad to hear it. Um, Dave Davis. Dave Davis. I Where's mean, begin? He created the the most inspirational rock and roll guitar sound. Yeah, yeah. and But it's also, when you actually stop and look at it, it's just too enormous to comprehend, you know, just how much. Right, I think, did. you know, their inspiration, their influence was so great. You and I wouldn't be sitting here right now. I no, wouldn't absolutely live in this house. You know, the, the baton that got passed from the kinks to to the who and 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 beyond in rock and yeah. roll is is so incredible. That the, yeah. their their place in the history of things is huge. Absolutely huge. And this it's a real, real honor to have this guy on. And he's got a new book out, um, his latest biography, because I think he had one a few years ago. This one's called Living, Living on, on Thin, Thin Line. Line. And and uh, and Guy and I have both uh, read it and it's we have it's, it's brilliant it's amazing it's amazing so, so let's get him on and find out what stories he has to tell welcome to the rock on tours okay guys i'm ready well, that's a big tune for sure i actually wrote that originally for tina turner of course i had gone and found joni mitchell down in florida and brought her back i've listened to a few of them and they've been really good man i'm sitting in the back of the car coming into london they're brilliant thank you guys for still being around still making music still being into it and doing this podcast it, it's uh, it's fabulous so great to talk to two guys that have done this remember me I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah. Two, two, getting good at something. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Keep on rocking! Yay! Yes! Can you see us? Yeah, you look great. Fantastic. Uh, Dave, just a fantastic honour to have you here to get to speak oh. to you. You're an oh. absolute legend to us. You're, you know, up there with one of the greatest influences on all of us, what you've done and what you've given this world of rock music. <laughs> but it's, but not as an, it's, but is that one of your paintings in the background? Yeah, I've got them all over the place. I'll finish them one day. <laughs> is that a spaceship or something? What is it? To be honest, I don't, don't quite know yet. I'll, I'll, I'll let, you, let you know when I find out. That's interesting. So, so are you better at finishing songs and finishing paintings then? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've certainly finished plenty of songs. Yeah, that's nice of you. Thank you. I feel a bit humbled and freezing. Well, you look very well. Are you buzzed on this on the on the reaction the books had? Yeah, really. I just, you know, it's hard. You know, you, you know it's hard doing mm -hmm. stuff. And people think, oh, you know everything, but it, no, no bug all, really. You just make it up as you go along. But obviously, <laughs> the, not in the book. I mean, make up. <laughs> I was going to say, wait, I've, I've just read it. What? <laughs> art. You mean art? <laughs> and then my. Now, me in, in, in the way you do things, you make it up. But do you find, you know, Dave? Yeah. I found when because I've you know we've all written books here. Um, when I wrote mine, and and you're amazed at the stuff you remember. But I'm if I pick up a copy of it now and look at it, music. It's it's, it's the no, music. Find, it's all gone. But all the stuff, it's like I was storing it on the drive until I could get it down. Then your brain goes, I don't need this anymore. The music <laughs> will restart memory. Ah, oh, oh, the music. So listening oh. to so, did you do that? Did you go oh, back and listen to yeah, the to yeah, the yeah, tracks? Because I was in that same place thinking, 
oh, great, now push comes to shove, and I can't remember anything. So I start from the music, and the m- music takes you back to places and people and where you went and what you did. What a lovely affirmation for music, that is. Well, yeah, you know, to, to know. me, that's all there is. Yeah. You know, really think about it, the, the memory and your life and your nervous system, everything. Dave, if you think back to your earliest time then, in your back in your family house in Muswell Hill, what is that song? What is that music that makes you think, that's me as a kid and the, some of the earliest mm-hmm. stuff I remember? I think it's weird. It's different for everybody, isn't it? But like, I've got to get to the root of this question. Did, was there a sort of style of music that was in your house that your mum and dad liked? Was it? Was it because I grew up next door to a pub in Islington? And Perfect. in the in this early sixties, that pub rock and roll hadn't happened to them. The older generation that lived and frequented in that pub were all singing, you know, old musical songs Mrs. around the Mills. piano, and that's what I grew up. Yeah, yeah. I bet yeah. it was a lot more honest, honest as well. The generation before mine were a lot more honest and get up and do stuff and stop moaning and do, no, I mean, just doing stuff. And I think like they learnt that from you know suffering through two wars. And yeah. They, they had to infuse themselves with optimism, even if it wasn't there. Islington's a great place. But yeah, that's why I'm a, that's why I'm an Arsenal fan. Oh God. <laughs> but but. <laughs> But, but actually, there was a bit in your book that I, there were two bits in your book at the beginning that I really connected with. One, I worked in a greengrocer's uh, as a school kid, which yeah. I know you did, right? Yeah. And putting up the show, and I worked with my brother, and putting up the show and talking to nightmare, when, right? Right. So, so you know, I'd I'd, I'd sell spuds to the to the local people in their council houses and flats, and I'd sell avocados, which I thought was a dessert, to the people who lived in Canterbury. <laughs> but, but also the other thing was my band originally rehearsed in the Camden Head in Camden oh, Passage oh, really? wow. and that's where the Kinks rehearsed yeah absolutely I loved it there but you know did you know that at the time, Gary? I, do you know what? When I when I read the book, I had a vague memory of people saying the Kinks used to rehearse here. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, did. Yeah. yeah, I remember that Brian Epstein came to. Audition the Kinks. Hello. At Ca- Camden Head. He said no, right? He or said no. No, <laughs> <laughs> no not for me, mate. So, so hang on. Just, no. this, just string this image out. Brian Epstein wearing a rather posh suit, I would have thought, walked into the Camden Head. He looked in Ca- cool. In he did look cool. Yeah. I, mean, I always thought, you know, he looked very cool. Good dresser. And what songs did you play him? I can't remember. It probably would have been "I'm Hog for You, Baby." Can't get enough of your love, or <laughs> something like <laughs> that, or um, not Beatles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I, I think he liked us. How did he get to hear of you in the first place? It was our upper class management. Oh, of course, um, yeah. And they knew everybody. I said they did. Granville Collins. Granville's great. Oh, my great guy. Great. Yeah. And he was so, um, I mean, we used to take the mickey out of each other, really. It's silly little working class kids and a silly posh top. Yeah, but yeah, it was yeah. good camaraderie. It's good. The mix of the, the vibe was great. Well, especially it must have been because he put you on that society circuit, didn't he? All those sort of posh parties. Well, he did, yeah. It... We wouldn't know what they were, you know, just... Yeah. Graffy little kids trying to make a bob, you know, few bob. But did, did you get to support the Beatles because of, of Brian's interest? Probably, probably, yeah. And um, I remember that gig and, and the Beatles, and um, I watched them and I thought, we're better than that, we're good. <laughs> I, I, I was so vain and young and... I thought we were better than everybody, but sometimes you have to be like that to get through. Because you, you had a bit of a vibe with Lennon, didn't you, for a bit? A bit of a kind of friendship. Yeah. Which, yeah, that, sounds, do, which sounds yeah. amazing. Someone someone who's a bit like, whoa, about John Lennon. is incredibly cool <laughs> for back then. But I, I didn't know I didn't know the business. So yeah. How are you supposed to act? Oh, you're acting on how you're supposed to act now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. There was no um, template or yeah. 
way of acting. He just said, oh, Eddie Cochran could do it. Why can't I? Lennon was quite jealous, wasn't he? You said in your book. Well, I think he was wary. He was very wary of everybody, I think. Which, when he, when he come into this business, especially at that time, he didn't know how, if he was going to be beaten up or... Oh, it was tricky. I don't recommend going into show business. Yeah, it's a bit late for us, I'm afraid, but thanks for the, yeah, thanks for the advice, Dave. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but the, the thing, but what's it, because that time is such a size, especially even the thing of, of, of having the posh manager in the society board, because it was the it was the, the one time of, I would say, the truest meritocracy time when a lot of those barriers were broken down. But also, you're in a world, you're talking about don't go into show business. This is when show business is becoming the music business that we know, there was, isn't it? Uh, there was really a music business. Yeah. It was kind of like... It was oh, package if... tours. It was, you know... Yeah, you're, it, was... You're kind of, it was kind of replacing the old music hall variety packages, weren't you? Well, that, it's funny you should say that because um, I come from a pretty big family. And, and yeah. Six sisters, one brother. And... Um, oh, yeah, who's that? <laughs> I don't I can't Sorry. remember his name. But, um, <laughs> no, a big family, a big working class family. You know. I have to be really corny and say that we were surrounded by an immense amount of love and encouragement. Mm -hmm. Like, we can do stuff, and oh, no, we can't do it. All my mates yeah. at school were, um, used to laugh at the fact that we were trying to play guitars, well, I'm still laughing. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the fact that um, we were doing it, you know, and yeah. my family were very encouraging, uh, uh, getting stuff done, or try that song, try this song. Because my family grew up, my mum and dad especially, they grew up with music. My sister grew, grew up with Oklahoma and South Pacific and... Oh, and it was wonderful, wonderful, talented people. And that's all going on in the background. You started off with that kind of blues R and B palette that everyone had, but then the well, breadth, yeah, but... the breadth, but the breadth of the songwriting there was clearly had been such a wider world that you've been exposed to. Oh yeah, but it yeah. was it was really quite. I think in the very beginning it was. The guy is pioneers from like the country and western, like Hank Williams, and uh, obviously the blues was cause mm -hmm. it was so new to us. But what was interesting, I was listening. Remember being a kid, when I'm trying trying to pick out a few chords, and listening to Lead Belly, mm -hmm. thing about being working on the railway. I think. My ankle works on the railway yeah. in King's yeah, yeah, Cross. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, that's why Skiffle was fitted in so well in the oh, UK, wasn't it? Right. And it was easier. And I was so, a big fan of Lonnie Donegan. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think he kind of broke through the, the class thing or the type of music we were listening to. It was great. Where were you hearing your first blues records, though? How, how did that? Did you, were you going to friends' houses who'd managed to yeah, find imports? Yeah, I've, I I had a friend at school who his name and it's not a joke. His name was Johnny Burnett. Wow! And always always imagined it to be Johnny Burnett. <laughs> and he, he to get his family were American. They used to get records from the states. Ah, oh, wow! And, and one day. He played me um, Sweet Little Sixteen by Chuck Berry. I thought I was going to go mad. What is it? What is the day? It's amazing. But it's funny when you look back at these incredible influences, there's a lot more going on than just what they're playing. Mm -hmm. The feeling, you know, paintings falling off the wall, everything. It's, <laughs> all, it's like film set, you know, listening to a movie. It's amazing. They call it nostalgia in the girls. I love that. The fact that, in you know, now we look on YouTube and see things, you know. Now, in those days, you know, you really listened to the record and you sat there going backwards and forwards on the record until you'd found found how to play well, it on your guitar. Because I was hypnotised. No, I never gave up. If you couldn't work it out, you'd make it up. You know, you make something up. 
make it sound similar now that that do, you know. The other thing we have in common, of course, Dave, and it's it's a it in Oh, I'm a great it, admirer it, it, of your music. Oh, right? thanks, mate. No, no, no. You know but thank you. But but the other thing we are in yeah, common is I've got my I know a bloody heart is. To, oh, you know. Cheers, mate. But is is I've got you I know, I played Oh god, I really enjoyed was it Peter Medak? Oh the craze. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Thank because you. we were approached by the craze, bless them, some years before. And um, because my sister, Gwen, her friends were the craze when they were, they were young. So I come from, not from my sort of, like Islington. My family was Islington, I yeah. saw Islington people. And um, it was a part of our, part of our history, a backstory. And, and Gwen, Said that uh, whenever the crows were in the neighborhood to get out of town <laughs> <laughs> because we didn't realize the obviously when we started and the, the backstory of the, the crime and the, the you did, we didn't realize that was going on at, at first. He did eventually the, the crime and the but you never met the craze, you never met the craze, no. But my sister knew them, and uh, whenever they used to come around. They used to send me to my other sister's towers and just say, Dave's not in. Me being the young, cute little boy and all that. And they, right. Get Dave out of here. Oh, right. You weren't allowed to see. I said, what? What, 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 what are you talking about? Dave, my thing that I'm, what I was talking about, about having in common with you is obviously being in a band with my brother for many years. Um, and I know is how it pleased. Good? Well, was it, good? It, it was good, actually. And I, I, I got on well. But it pleased my parents because because both of us were were doing well in this group, and I guess your parents must have had a, uh, been really pleased to see that Ray well, yeah, and because, you, cause because you were his little those, brother, weren't you? You know. Oh yeah, and in those days, nobody had any any money, right? It was big for of steel, and uh, everybody was saying, um, "You you can't take up music," you know. Nobody gets. Any decent money. My mum was happy. For start, she could get rid of us. And it's a job. Yeah. Make your own bleeding money. <laughs> that sort of attitude, you know. You know, it, I have very fond memories of, of growing up in Muswell Hill, North London. And it was a very exciting time. That time was very exciting. Because it seemed like you could do, do anything. Because yeah. you stayed there for a long time, didn't you, Dave? After that, this is what I find interesting is after your success, rather than moving straight into the groovy Chelsea pad, you stayed in Muswell Hill. I, I remember thinking that when, when I was going to buy a house, I thought, I got a mate who lives off Pink's Road. I'm going to have a look at places, see what I like, yeah. And I felt homesick. <laughs> 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 All of a sudden, you find yourself in New York or LA, and you think, "Wow, wow, we didn't know what, what you know, we didn't know what, what we were doing." Part of it must have been because you were very young. You were seventeen, weren't you, when you had your first? Yeah, yeah you were incredibly yeah. young. Yeah, yeah, it's scary to think back now. Yeah, that age difference between you and Ray, which is only three yeah, but years. No, but those at days, that age, at that age, that's a lot. That's, that's a lot. That's what I mean. Exactly. That was a gulf. Yeah. yeah. And well, was there ever that feeling from from Ray? Oh, I've got to take my little brother around with me. Or was he? No. Was he? Abs were you absolutely bonded? It, no, it was like Ray. Had, Ray was a funny guy. When we got on the football field, we were really together and protective of each other. But after that, you were in your own kid. Yeah, we were always close. I mean, like, impossible to have spent that amount. Of time and years work, working together without without being close, but there's different types of being close. From reading your book, a lot of your more overt kind of disagreements were with other people in the band. Well, I yeah, know. I think Ray and I were weird to each other, but we're very protective of each other because of the family. Yeah, yeah, connection. You know, it's all right for me to call them bug or whatever. But if anyone else did, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
<laughs> I can see what you're saying, Dave, about, you know, you feeling homesick, just going to view a property in Chelsea. <laughs> and and that Ray's obsession with home was, was always, has always been there. I mean, you know, 10 years later, he writes Muswell wow. Hillbilly's album. You released that album. You know, it's, it's so much part of your DNA that you're trying, you know, both of you trying to, tell the rest of the world about the characters that you've grown up with, that the characters that are in your family, the interesting parts of old London that seem to be dying out. It's a really interesting <clears throat> time because you've got Harold Wilson talking about the white heat of technology. You've got tower no. blocks going up. The empire had gone and all the, all everything you knew about being working class and socially and culturally could be wiped off the map. And there was a sense of preservation that you guys we're trying to put around it. Well, thank you. You're right. It's true. And I, um, I don't think it was a good job. I was so young because um, I could blame everything on Ray because he was older. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I had a kind of an attitude of just go and do it and you know, not worry about what part, political party. I, I didn't know anything about that just living. I think a part of, of what we lost about that time is just living, like having the sense to know how to care about each other and who to look mm -hmm. after and who to protect, which had kind of gone though. So it, we live, it's like a sort of gang warfare now, even in politics, like gang warfare. And, well, um, yeah, it's all about, everything is divide and rule. Everything is you know that's yeah and, and, and politics oh, no i shouldn't say it, but politics really depressed me i'd rather make friends with someone or, or try to mm -hmm. and have a point and say what's going on how do you feel and that because that's in the end of the day when you're left alone with the guy or people you say what do you talk about you talk about how you feel then that's when we're losing a lot, the core connection as human beings. How do you mm -hmm. feel, mate? Oh, a bit of dodgy. You know, just real things. Not, yeah. oh, do you like my new Savile Row suit? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I think what's the epitome of the kinks, you know, when, when you were in your absolute pomp, is, is being able to tell stories about the kind of weird characters, the old... Which, from my mum and dad, but our extended family were very close. Ray has written about this character in many guises, in many ways, in, in songs. And then with the, our Uncle Frank, Uncle Frank, oh, so yeah. classic. <laughs> he couldn't make it up. My dad was Frank. Yeah, <laughs> I probably knew him as well. He was like a cartoon character. Oh, why am I happy? I don't know. All this, you know. <laughs> they were real people, they weren't comics, but they weren't. They that's how people were. And that when you moved to Muzzle Hill, you thought it looks a bit posh, you know. yeah. <laughs> There's a whole, I mean, what's brilliant is taking those characters and I mean, something like Arthur, where who's that's based on your brother in law, isn't it? Who went to Adelaide, yeah, went to, but then, but then, yeah. then doing a whole treatise on empire and the fall of empire based on the, from that one little you know nugget of an idea, yeah. I think it's because Ray, Ray was the oldest, eldest, oldest, I know, and uh, by three years, he was also a very quiet kid, and I think it helped inform his style of writing. And that was a great plus. So I think because Rini, uh, one of her sisters who died on Ray's birthday, she had a heart problem. Well, yeah, that's, it's a tragic she story, was, that. Yeah, tragic. She was a great painter, artist, and uh, a musician. We learned a lot from her. But I think it was almost like that analogy with the, um, the story of the secret cause. I think Ray was kind of wait for really to know to impart some sort of info code or something no, which no. she did in a way she did now i think ray had been searching for this lost cord all his life maybe before we know 
that's how he honed his craft. There were three great London bands, weren't there? All telling stories of working class people. That's obviously you, Small Faces and The Who. Yeah, you know, but yeah. most of all, I would have said, you know, I mean, let's look at Arthur. You know, Guy just mentioned Arthur, the, mm. the, yeah. the concept album, which was 1968, year, right. the year yes. before yeah. Tommy. I mean, it must, it must have been one of the first concept albums. Is, am I right to say that? Well, you were. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think um, we knew what the Who were doing and then what they were trying to copy us again. What did they? Oh, no, because wasn't no, yeah, because, because there was a there was a script and a TV idea with it, wasn't yeah, there? Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. ICV had a, Ray was working on a, a film script for TV uh, with who was the guy Julian Mitchell, I think the guy was, you know, but that all kind of collapsed. We had all the music, so we didn't make an album. Also, Pi Records let us use the big studio. Bigger knobs and things. You know. That's no, funny it's you because you you'd had you'd had you'd had all these massive hits before. You've been a massive act, and there's and now they let you use the big studio. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Dave, was there a, cool. was there a sense of anger though when when Tommy came out? Because I mean, I said I said I was talking to a guy this morning. There's a track on Arthur called Johnny Thun Johnny Thunder. Oh yeah, Courtsy, yeah. Uh, real guy. Is is with you know something that Pete completely uses in Tommy. Well, there's a there's <laughs> three there's three bits of it which are kind of and it and it's it's just essence of Tommy. You can say it's it's nothing you, apart from that one core sequence. But more to the point, did Johnny Thunders get his name from that track? Well, Johnny I Thunder wonder. character <laughs> is based on it's very song, so I don't want to speak out of line. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Oh, yeah, why not? There was a biker in Muscle Hill. He was so out of place. He had, he thought he was James Dean or Brando or someone. And he really dressed up for it. And he had a girlfriend who used to do it on only. And do, have you ever, ever been to Muswell Hill? I have. My, my yeah. stepdad's from Muswell Hill. So I used to oh. go there a lot as a kid. I can't remember the um, name of the road. At <laughs> the top of the hill. No, it's actually a hill. At the top, it's a great view at the horns of the hill. Johnny Thunder and he's surrounded by roundabout. And one slope is a footrest got caught on the road. And the bike went topsy turvy and wonky, and the poor guy died. But God. that was my yeah. view of what eventually became Johnny Thunder. Johnny Thunder lives on water. Um. Kids on that now. So it's, it's partially romanticized, but but as with all the great writing, right? Ray is a great writer and um, documenter of our times as well. Yeah. Well, that's actually, I want, uh, Dave, I want to get on to, because you've written some fantastic songs and there's, and it's probably quite nice, but the difference, I would say, certainly in this earlier stuff, between you and Ray, as you were saying, Ray would basically find a character or invent a character and then base it around someone, someone that you knew or some part of your extended family or some local character and tell tell a truth through that. Whereas you're right, yeah. Death of a Clown, Susie still, Suzanne still alive. You took much more direct experience, didn't you? That's why I thought um, rock and roll was really about people yeah. having a good time or finding out how to have a good time. <laughs> And um, that's why I think that whenever they talk about rock and roll, well, that's, they really, you know, that's why Chuck Berry has to fulfil a great part of that heritage or lineage or whatever you call it. Because he was singing about, I mean, who could sing about a, men a menu? It's <laughs> like, uh, when it all rhymed and that, wow, it's kind of pretty incredible. I mean, you... You go home and you play too much monkey, monkey business or play it in the studio. It's amazing lyric. You know, it's a, it's a, it's about life that was going on then, but it's funny. He had the knack of knowing when to use humour. I just want to go back to what guys saying, Dave, about your you putting your personal stories into your songs because Susanna is still alive. I mean, this is quite an amazing story that reveals itself within your books. She was a, a girl that you met 
at school when you were 15 was it and and yeah you want to tell some of that story yeah it's, i get quite emotional when thinking about it it was like yeah, it was like my first love at school and uh, she was older than me and um i felt her have heels pursuing when it, you know it's oh those no. were the days when um Oh shit! Where do I start? Where do I end? Still going. Um, she got pregnant, didn't she? And your yeah. mum, mum didn't want you two to ever be together, and she was sent away. We, yeah, she was worried about really about the boys not having jobs. Yeah, and they were worried yeah. about me ending up being a barrel boy. It was good to be a barrel boy, but uh, it ended up working at the market. And she wanted better things for us. And she, the day I walked in with Sue on my arm and said, Mum, we're going to get married, thinking she was going to explode in some rapturous, joyous moment, she went, hmm, what have you done, David? Like, have you ruined your life? I said, Mum, we're in love. Oh. But to her, it was like a setback. We were heading on the course, in, in her mind, of a life that was going to be more bountiful than, you know, the yeah, week. Mum's always know. Mum's always know. But she was pretty smart, my mum. What's really moving in the story is that you, you didn't see your child for, for 30 years. Or... Yeah. No. And then I, I did. Then Tracy called me up at the office. <laughs> Oh, you don't have to go through it, Dave. Sorry. Oh, just, it was, it's such a great part of the book. And the way you put your art in, you're, you try to st – you're still thinking about this when you write that song, Susanna's Still Alive, and is is really moving to us as people who like to listen to music and get something from that music. Yeah. But the fact that there's a – it's a real uh, Romeo and Juliet story. Yeah, yeah I know. It's, well. It so. still moves me today, and I think about it, but, like, you know, you move on, your life changes, and you, you, you mark back on this great adventure of playing in the rock band, uh, hopefully to be the next Eddie Cochran. <laughs> no, because really... I want to get on to the other one, because what's interesting, because Death of a Clown, which is a masterpiece, this is a fantastic oh, song. And there's, there's a very funny story about you doing a German TV with it in the book. <laughs> But, it was, but it's interesting how you're dealing with such massive elemental things, right? If you look at your titles, the Susanna's still alive, then death of a clown. <laughs> like, yeah. Everything is like totally. <laughs> but I love that. I love the, the there's a YouTube video uh, you sent me, Guy, of, of, of Dave doing it on yeah. TV somewhere. Of, of you doing it on at, TV. At the end of it, you're sticking up two fingers to someone. I don't know who you're doing. <laughs> Through that person. Probably the cameraman, probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, but th th it's a really interesting song as well isn't it because because you you you'd put it was on a kinks album but it also came out as a dave davis solo record that's right yeah um the management robert and grove at the time thought it could be a chance for me to embark on a solo career which i, I kind of toyed with the idea but i was a bit a bit of a homeboy though even though i don't know all the girls and the champagne and but you, well, you still were, but that's what the funny thing for the because it sounds like when you 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 write this song as a moment at a moment of kind of self realization of realizing you've got yeah. to change, but then you don't really do you <laughs> for a while or so. Yeah, seems. give me a point. It's, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> no, it's 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 really funny when my my whole life life has been like that. It's like wanting things to change so much and then you look around and then how has it changed has it changed so much you know people talk no longer words and they speak in like a different language in a way it's a very different language the english language and those days me and ray used to communicate by telepathy, I think, because we never really had a conversation unless it was about the Arsenal or Derek Tab Squad or something. <laughs> oh, yeah, and then we'd open up. But, how are you? Oh, oh, yeah, not bad. Okay. Now the conversation. Are you, are you talking about the sort of dishonesty of blokes that we always we're always talking? <laughs> we, you know, we talk about football or we'll, we, we distract, you know, we're not really ever going to be emotional yeah. with each other. No, yeah, I think you're right. It's, it was it, the leftovers 
from, I think, our parents and the war years. You can't talk about weird stuff like psychiatry. Don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. Stiff up a lip and all that. It was the leftovers from that area, really. Mm. And, and, like, of course, when we got into show business, which, which was full of gay people, even before gay, gayness or being gay was legal, in 65 and 6, I think it only became legal in 66, I think. No, it, it was... Um, I th- I, it was like seventy. It was actually incredibly late, or something. It was. But in show business, when you when you're in business, yeah, oh, 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 this. <laughs> well, because well, your attitudes on that front, I must say, uh, uh, were so incredibly ahead of their time, which, which is brilliant. Which is that you there was no issue, which is like kind of where we are now. Yeah, you talk really casually in your book about your, you know, your uh, bisexuality at the time. I think I was young enough to not have not be tainted by all the, the, the social um, hypocrisy or whatever, you know, of the time. Mm. And I had boyfriends, I used to go clubbing with, with me and my mates. We would dance and and, um, and I only realised how much I adored women after I had a very deep relationship with a guy. That was that the TV presenter? Yeah, yeah. Michael. Johnny yeah. yeah, and... Uh, I loved them in a way, and I, but I didn't. I wasn't in love with them. Like, it mm-hmm. took me ages to work out what it was. But it was like it's like appreciation and, and wanting to share things rather than yeah. get a give off, mate. And I, I, <laughs> but there was that element as well, though, mm. of the get your give off. But as a person, I do, you know, it's got mm-hmm. feelings. And why should I? Mm-hmm. Like art and, and be a little bit effective and want, want, want to wear unusual clothes. And I loved unusual. Unusual was my main, main thing as a kid. Well, you I mean, you a, know, this was, a, this was an you're amazing was a time, dresser. though, wasn't it? Of, you know, men growing their yeah. hair, wearing more feminine clothes and working class well, people I, suddenly mixing with middle class, upper class people. I mean, yeah. this had ever happened before, it seemed to me, you know? Yeah. I remember I was 16 or 15, and I saw a picture of Oscar Wilde. And I thought, wow, what a cool dude. I want to be like that. That TV programme of you doing Death of a Clown, is you could actually be auditioning for the part of Oscar in a Oscar. play. <laughs> well, listen, what's, what's funny, though, is that picture you're talking about was taken just as he'd arrived in New York to do the, the yeah. tour of America. And that was like the first rock and roll tour, really. I mean, yeah. he... He spent a year touring America then and becoming a superstar. Dave, what I want to get back on, what I want yeah, to get on to do, do, yeah. is you with Shell Tell Me and you really got Oh, me. yeah, yeah, yeah. And the moment that you basically, you personally yes, you thank found you. a sound that was just about you. You found a sound that was going to be about every rock and roll guitarist for the next 50 yeah. oh, years. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I mean, that riff, everything about that riff, the simplicity of it, the rawness of it, but you've got to tell us about how you came to find that sound. Out of frustration. I didn't know what to do. You know, it was like, and uh, we used to have an electric shop, a radio shop next to Dunwood T- Terrace where we, we lived, two, two blocks. No, two houses down. And the, the Ted, his name was Davis, no relation, Ted Davis. I walked in there one day and there was this little green amplifier I said, I'll bet that sounds good. <laughs> Bought it for 10 quid and explained the whole world to change overnight. I plugged in there. And went, <laughs> oh, man, back to square one. And out of the, that frustration, I cut the corner speaker up and then things started to happen. It's when the, the grit started to come out of the app. And I was, because didn't you you also because you give this description the book where it sounds like you you had quite a few amps which is quite impressive and you were like plugging yeah. amps into other amps like yeah it was, oh, it's and funny because really, an, an AC thirty which is a bit posh that that really I mean there might be a timeline problem there I did, it yeah. happened a bit it later does... but that also you got to remember we had luckily. We had a relative, my sister's husband, Mike, worked at um, 
British Airways, which you believe. He was a musician, a guitar player. And he introduced me and Roy to Burt Wheaton. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. heard so I love to play. Yes, the play oh. a day, play a day. Play a day, yeah. But um, that was the only way to learn. You know, the, the first time someone gave me a chart of you know, music, I thought, oh, fuck. I'm oh, sorry. And what I used to do, I used to predict the notes that were coming. I kept make, make, thinking I was making up a scale because I thought what should come next. You know, bah, 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 yeah, bah, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, ex- yeah. Uh, I know exactly what you mean. And that it's part true. that's true. That's, that's yeah. what you do with music. You, you learn it to make it yeah. up. I was actually very, very interested in science fiction. And music is like science fiction when you start it out. It's kind totally. of like, future. You know, yeah. Yeah, it's the future. Maybe it's yeah. a waste of future. Transport ourselves. But if, if which they, it is, it is really. Guy, there was probably, if he's in the studio with Shell Tommy, there's probably a Wem sitting there, right? That's that belongs to the studio. So that's, that must, yeah. It wasn't necessarily oh. Dave's amp, I'm thinking. That, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, it's only in the book he's, you talk you talk about in your bedroom and you had, and and it, it's, it oh. sounds quite technologically sophisticated of how you're taking outputs wow. from one amp and putting them into another one. So yeah. making that amp a preamp. I was thinking, really? But nevertheless, it was a yeah, relationship. Yeah. It was yeah, a anyway. razor blade that made that made this 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 first the ori- original this sound. Yeah, you know, messing about a razor blade, and a funny little amp. And then obviously the follow up to that, you know, all the day, all all of the night, you know, was really you know making pushing that even further. Yeah, I w- always thought that all day was what you really got. We should have been, but actually, when you when you play them back to back. You really got me. It's got a place in in history. The... Yes. Well, yeah, the door set because we didn't know what we were doing. That's a, that's, that's yeah. a great thing about music. Is like the best stuff happens when you don't know what you're doing. I think there's a lovely comparison you make as well when you say that that how that early stuff you did completely influenced all the bands around at the time you know from the who and everyone you know, we all know can't explain comes straight from you really got me and and yeah. uh, and, and the doors which you always completely admit. stole it the doors all just stole it didn't they for hello blatant, R- that's a blatant, blatant, blatant <laughs> steal yeah what's interesting is it's your later stuff that influenced everyone who came later to blur and madness and yeah, everyone what, like that that's what happens yeah, but yeah. good. I'm glad. No, it's a, it's, it's a fantastic legacy. Was there? Was it, it actually? That's a good point, though, guy. Was there ever a feeling, Dave, in in your career that you'd push the door open, and then other people were just sort of running in over the top of you sometimes? Yeah, I guess so. But like when you're young, you think you're, you're kind of invincible a bit. You know, you think, oh, don't worry about it. No, there'll be something else. It's like my old man used to say, oh, don't worry about it. Something else had come along. Because that period of the of the mid-60s is, is things are moving so fast, yeah. so insanely fast, aren't they? If you think of what a record sounded like in 1964 compared to what a record sounded like in 1960, like what a guitar sounded like from year to year. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no. absolutely. Yeah. I remember that um, when I'm... Because of my movies, there's a lot of inf- different yeah. stuff going on. Like... Saturday night and Sunday morning was really an, uh, uh, an incredible cultural, Mm-mm-mm. had incredible impact on me and Roy. And when I met Albert Finney, it was like me and a, a relative. There was and, all this stuff going on. Tom Courtney, it was like me and a brother. You know, so, wow, it's not just music, it's everything, the fashion. And you all used to play football together, didn't you? There was some showbiz yeah. eleven you used to play for. Yeah, Tom Tom Courtney was a good footballer, probably still. <laughs> but it used to be funny. It's showbiz eleven. It used to be. It was serious, but it was a joke at the same time. Mm-mm. I think and what you're uh, talking about as well is that that it was it was an amazing time because suddenly. Working class people had an art form that wasn't just a joke like music hall. You know, this was this was seriously talking about. Hey, I like musical. <laughs> I like musical, but you know what I mean. Not yeah. it wasn't just joking yeah. about it. It was about real pretty stuff and was... finding a place out out in the uh, you know in the public imagination. Well, no, it did, and it, it, it happened in a strange way because a lot of 
Ray's writing, not nurtured, but everything's nurtured by everything art. It's like events in time, meet a guy in a pub and you write a song about him. Ray is a great observer of people and what they do, why they do it, mm-hmm. and where they're going or where they think they go. <laughs> and um, these forces were very prominent at the time. It's the social... You've got to be, what, 10 years older, young, younger than me? Yeah, uh, we're, we're in our, both in our early 60s, me, me and Guy. Yeah. Right. Yeah, 10 years younger than you. 10 years younger than you. Right? Yeah. So, but it was a big, big thing culturally and the school system. I mean, I hardly went to school, so I wouldn't know, but I really did rebel uh, at school. I did not like being told what to do. And um, Did that run into being in the band with with Ray? I mean, was that yeah. you know, was that an issue? No, it, it, it was it was okay because we were family. Right, okay. All oh, right, yeah. I get in You know, there was quite a lot of fighting on your stage, though, wasn't there? Not just between you. Yeah, but it was... Yeah, but was, yeah just, the more averse stuff was was with Mick, wasn't it? Mick, that was, yeah. Seemed to be, you, Dear you, old you, Mick. You nearly died. You nearly died one night, didn't you? I saw it coming. One inch the other way. Yeah. No, if, this is a hi-hat. Apparently, Mick, Mick tried to hit uh, Dave with a hi-hat stand, which apparently, if in Dave had moved, it would have sliced end, your neck open. The things get, you know, dramatised and saturated and... It's What's in your book, mate? <laughs> yeah, I know, but you can't make it look colourful. I got, got up the front of my head, my head back on. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was very, very awful. Wasn't it? The audience thing for shit because they thought it was a part of the show. <laughs> Die, dead. <laughs> <laughs> You know what's funny is um, in the book is because uh, because David Watts was a song obviously that is I, I think Lovely it's, um, what album's David Watts on uh, Dave? Ah uh, yes, good point. Um, Wish I could be like on, David uh, Watts, right? So the Jam did it, didn't they? And obviously it was a big yeah. The Jam, did, yeah. And then in your book, we're suddenly we suddenly get to see who David Watts really was, and it wasn't anything like yeah, the David Watts I imagined. <laughs> it wasn't like anybody I imagined. When I'm in. It's, it sounds it's it's yeah, like I one didn't. of those sixties movies, like I, if it sounds yeah. like, like that that's yeah, that yeah. scene whole scene at the house. Yeah, you know, I, I wasn't um, I was a bit of a lad, but I didn't know about homosexuality or and who, and it, it was all fun and exciting. And what happened? Who was David Watts? He was a prom a promoter that lived in Rutland, right on weekend. And um, <laughs> who did that? Rutland Weekend. Te- that, that was Eric, Eric Idle. Eric Idle yeah. did Rutland Weekend television. Anyway, which is, which is we did this from. this gig in Rutland. I was like, oh, great. And, and the promoter asked us to go back to his house for a few drink House, like a mansion for a few drinks. And... Um, we get in and get in there with a the beer and oh, you know, we don't have that stuff. Have some pink champagne. Oh, I can go. Oh. <laughs> and uh, and one thing led to another. The uh, longer the evening went on, I noticed that there were no women in the, the groups of people. And, it was, and even local CID were gay guys. You know, I've never... At that's, that time, that's the amazing angle. That's I ne- amazing. That never angle. saw a copper with pink socks on before. And that was a giveaway. <laughs> anyway, basically, well, David, uh, David Watts fell in love with you a bit uh, uh, that night. Yeah, yeah. excessively yeah. so. And, you know, and um, I and think Ray really... tried to swap you for his house. Yeah, he probably thought he was saving a few years' misery. <laughs> get him a yeah. house and get rid of him. Oh. A good race I tried to swap you for his house. Oh, yeah. So the story yeah. goes that the Ray chatted up David Watts to get to swap me for, for his house. His <laughs> posh house. <laughs> and uh, I know a silly sort of didn't tweak to ages. And then he wound you up even further by writing a song. I wish I could be like David Watts. I know. He wound everybody up, especially David. 
So I, don't, don't but I, I wonder if the I wonder if the jam would have been so keen on doing it if they knew that was the story. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny yeah. because yeah. <laughs> I remember so, so many years later I met Paul Weller and he, he was I was making a solo album at Kong and he came around I think about the beginning of the rise to fame and, and uh, he had. Uh, a 45 of Susanna still alive. Wow. Oh, wow. And he wanted me to sign it. And so I didn't have the oh. heart, to, heart to tell him about David Woods. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, you've been part of, of some of the greatest records. I mean, it's unbelievable listening yeah, to the music over yeah. the last few days. I mean, the, well, days. They, there you go. There's, a, there's an amazing song. Oh, yeah. You know, I played on Kirsty McCall's version of that. Oh, oh, it's great, bro. It's great. Yeah. Like there's it, always a, there's always some connection oh, with guy playing bass on with every one of our guests. <laughs> but but the other one, of course, I mean Lola. We can talk about that. You know, Ape Man, oh. the first record I ever bought, Dave. Ever. Oh man, bless you. And right. I still have it downstairs. Yeah. I, went, I went out. I was ten, and I went with my brother down to the record shop. We'd been working in the greengrocers, and we'd earned our wage packet. <laughs> We decided we'd both buy a seven inch record and he bought the troubles, me and my life, and I bought Eight Man. Good choice. Waterloo Sunset, I mean, almost certainly is on my list as one of the greatest songs ever. Yeah. Ever written. Do you remember that moment? Uh, okay. And how was this it? Where I get to and say, I'm a, I'm and I'm from Waterloo. All right. You're all from Islington. I'm from Waterloo. Oh, yeah. So there you go. That'll do. Uh, yeah. And he's experiencing the sunset of his life right now. Oh. <laughs> the sunset of my career, certainly. Yes. Um, <laughs> but, but how was the writing, uh, Dave? Did you did some of it come out of jamming, or did you just suddenly turn? Did Ray just say, "Come and have a listen to this"? Well, it was both. It was like Waterloo Sunset come out of a, a piano piano riff that Ray was playing, and um, we tied it up to fit the guitar sound at the time. And um, it also, it was a great song. I mean, it's the hardest yeah, but, song. Yeah, no, but your, gets, your guitar is, is like, it's that thing of, of perfect, perfect arrangements. Those guitar licks but that's yours what, could not be more perfect than if a, oh, there is nothing that would fit oh, as well as they do. You know? Well, thank you. But I thought that's what professional musicians did, is that you compliment well, the song. Well, I, ideally, it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was more, a lot of the work we did, me and Ray, was done by instinct. And Ray was a craftsman, really, but there's so many nuances that go into a, a, a ploy or a character or a method. Or, you know, it's not easy, but sometimes it's accidental. All these things happen. It's not weather, you know. So, oh, it's pissing down the rain today. You change it. Music's a wonderful, wonderful way of creating peace, and creating love, and creating things you, you didn't know you were aware of. Because Leonard Bernstein talked about You Really Got Me, didn't he, as being a perfect expression of the Mixolydian mode or whatever. Yeah. You, which, you, you, you wouldn't know that. No, I but I do now. Yeah, I do. I do now. She told me. <laughs> you know, we're well, talking about influences as well, guy. You know, we've, we we missed because uh, we we talked to Shell Tell me about this, didn't we? See my friends, which has that Indian drone in oh, it. Yeah, which, which is actually the first the first Indian thing, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah that, before the Beatles yes. ever did anything. Yeah. I mean, admittedly, Norwegian Wood had a sitar on it, but. I think it, this was the first time any drone or any I Asian uh, influence had, had come into music. And it was with you guys again. How did you get that yeah. sound, by the way, that drone? Well, it's really like Ray had this idea for a song and we wanted a kind of a backbeat that was like a drone. Ray had this 12 string famous guitar. We detuned it from the original streaming. So that sound sounded more like a drone. And then we mixed it in with my electric drone sound, and then it kind of evolved out of that. I don't know, it right. probably got a whole different story about it, but 
I always felt there was a lot of emotion. I see my friends playing across the river, like uh, in river, all, yeah, you know, like, never to be sleep. <laughs> Kind of yeah, I, want to, I want to finish up there by talking about a bit more about your your influences as the as a band because it's quite extraordinary. The first time I think, you know, I ever heard uh, where have all the good times gone? It would have been the Bowie version on Pinups. It wasn't actually your right. time. Which, that version made me go back and listen to a lot more of your stuff. You know, but then you've oh, got good. you know, stop your sobbing, Pretenders, the hard way. Um, you know, <clears> there's, <throat> there's so much inspiration that the Kinks have. Of, of given bands that that appeared in the one of my yeah favorite covers of the pink song is by the stranglers all day and all, all of the night oh right and that's one of my favorite but um you know i i loved you know obviously when van halen co covered you really got me yeah yeah and be became a worldwide success one thing's for sure one thing i've learned is you've got a lot of love yeah, absolutely. And it's been a real pleasure having you on. Real honour for I, us. No, yeah, it's a great real, to, real honour. Real it's honor. great to see you guys, and, uh, and thanks for making it easy. Good luck with the book. And you've got an thanks. album, and they've they got an album that complements the book, right? Yeah, it's an album that we pieced together a, a bunch of songs that complement the book and remixes and as a, a nice version of a, a song I wrote called Strangers. It's about how we get to a point, we, we grow up in a family, and like Dave's, our family, and and you come to a point where really, in a way, you're kind of strangers. You might have lived together for 10, 20 years or whatever, but really strangers. And it, it takes a while to get to know people, I think. It's really a, a song about friendship, I guess. They've loved um, your brother. Just to finish off, yeah. actually, yes. I, should say, I hear there's going to be more kink stuff. Is that going to happen? I hope, I hope so. Yeah, Good. we're trying to get some. There's a there's a lot of stuff there. You know, it needs knocking to shape and get it together. We yeah. need. Yeah, we need. I've got to say, Dave, because you're someone who, you know what? Frankly, you you've been the soundtrack of my. I've always listened to you, and I always will. And I know I can probably get, say the same for Gary. Yeah. So. I even yeah, played yeah. one of your. I played one of your songs at his fiftieth birthday party, didn't I? You did. You did. Oh, you did. what was it? Because you really got me. Yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> there you all go. right, mate. All the best. All right. Yeah. Take care. Thank you very much. Sure, thank, thank you, you David. Thank love. you so much. Lots love. of love. Oh, what a what oh. a beautiful man. What a beautiful man. And what uh, there's so and we barely scratched the surface. Because uh, well, I really would recommend that book to anyone because it's the. Um, but then you need to put a lot of time aside because you're going to be listening to a lot of music. That's true. Absolutely. That's what that's what you do. But it, it is very honest, isn't it? It's. I mean, it's unbelievably honest. Unf about the unflinching, thing. I believe, is the word one would use. Yeah. 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 So uh, thank you for listening. Oh, it's so nice to be back. I'm sorry we had to take a break for a couple of weeks. I know I've got some texts and emails from friends who listen and go, what am I meant to be doing on a Sunday morning? Now you're not here. I know. So, so we're responsible for everyone now, aren't we? <laughs> it's true. <laughs> uh, we accompany dog walks and coffees and all, all kinds of uh, things, um, avoiding real life. That's right. <laughs> uh, but we're back for a while. We've got quite. A few... We've got we've got quite the list. We have got quite the list, people. So keep it here. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's good night from me. Good night from them. <laughs> <laughs>